Well, good morning, and thank you so much for being here with us on this chilly Sunday. And if you're watching online or maybe in one of our gatherings, welcome. I hope you're having a great day, a great, great gathering, a good fellowship where you are this morning. My name's Dan DeBruler. And you know, a few minutes ago, we, we were singing that song with the line, you won't relent until you have it all. And you know what? That's what Jesus wants. That's what he is asking from each and every one of us. And as we talk about living deep, as we talk about spiritual depth in our everyday life, that's really where we're headed. We're headed toward giving him our all because you can't really be part in and part out and call yourself Christian. We have to agree that deep is good. Philosophers think deep thoughts. We want deep relationships. We have great tomatoes when our tomato plants have deep roots. We understand that depth is good and depth is desirable. And that's what we're going to talk about today as we approach this. And you know, without a doubt, there are people in your life, people in your circle of influence, maybe even people in your own family who see the fact that you call yourself Christian as a mere inconvenience, just something coincidental to the relationship. And I had a conversation just a few moments ago in the hallway with someone who was in a situation like that and it reminded me of one in my own life where we would repeatedly get invited to these cookouts. And at these cookouts, after the beverages would start to flow a little bit, there was one guy... And you know the guy, because you have him in your life too, man or woman, who wanted to pick that bone that he had with the church. And we would go again and again, and every time it would be the same, maybe not the exact same argument, but it would be the same set of circumstances. They had something against the church. They were formerly with a church, but now they had a little bit of a problem there. And we kept getting invited back. And I remember my wife saying, why do you even engage? Why do you keep going into that conversation? You know where it's going to go. And the truth is that they knew where the truth was. They knew that we were not going to waver. They knew that I would engage. They knew that I would stick to that point and that I would remind them of what they knew, that I would remind them that the truth still exists and that Jesus still loves them, and that God still created them for, for a purpose. Whether they wanted to embrace that or not was a different story. But if you've got those people in your life, those people who want to constantly engage you and debate you about the gospel, about the truth of it all, I just want to encourage you to stand. You don't have to stand in a mean, ogre-like way. But don't waver on your faith. Be faithful to remind those who you come in contact with that God loves them, that Jesus died for them, and that there is more for them. So as we talk about living deep, I want to remind you, this is the, the passage. You'll, you'll hear this again and again all this month in 1 John 2, 24. And John, John is speaking as someone who walked with and learned from Jesus himself. But this is written some 50, 60 years after that. People are beginning to have a few questions. He said this in 1 John 2, 24. Let what you heard from the beginning abide in you. If what you heard from the beginning abides in you, then you too will abide in the Son and in the Father. And, and he goes on. Because th this verse here, it reminds us that we may have questions. We may run into doubts in our own lives. But he's saying there's an answer to those questions. He's saying that when we walk faithfully with Christ, we have the answers. So even though situations and relationships may get a bit tumultuous sometimes, just remember, you've got the answer. It's been given to you if you remain with those things, and you let those remain in you as well. He continues on, and by the way, if you've got uh, the, your phone with you today, and you've got the Rockfish app, you can click on Take Notes, and you can 
find these passages and take notes and, and go back to them for later as well. But it continues in verse 25 saying, and this is the promise that he himself made to us, eternal life. I've written these things to you concerning those who are trying to deceive you. As for you, the anointing you received from him remains in you, and you don't need anyone to teach you. Instead, his anointing teaches you about all things and is true and is not a lie. Just as it has taught you, remain in him. So we're talking about going deep. We're talking about getting deeper in our, in our relationship with Christ, letting this spirituality, this, this Jesus thing, this Christianity have a place to form deep roots in our life. And as we talk about that, I want to go into talking about a deep walk, what a deep walk looks like as we examine 1 John and what it means to go deeper into our faith. Again, this was written some 50 plus years after Jesus' ministry on the earth ended and his disciples took over and began to spread the church. That's two or three generations. And think about it. Maybe your great-grandfather was a solid man of God. Your great-grandmother was one who, who sat with her daughter and her grandchildren and taught them at the table, taught them to love the Lord and to sing songs of praise. But you get two or three generations down the road, things could be dramatically different. For the grandparents in the room, you understand that. If you had grandchildren in school, school-age kids, and they begin to come home with, with the things that they've learned, you realize that the world is teaching them a lot of different things, and we begin to dilute what we know to be true with what is absolutely untrue, and we end up with this, uh, it's, well, the big term is syncretism. We, we begin to merge all these thoughts and these beliefs together, and we begin to, even in our understanding of the Word of God, begin to misunderstand the intent of the Word of God. As we, we take what sounds good that comes our way, but we don't grab hold of everything that is actually true. So two or three generations down the road, things can change a lot. And that's what's happening in the world that John is writing to. They're wondering, how, how do you know if someone is a real Christian? How do I know if I'm a real Christian? And so John is addressing that in this letter. What is a real Christian? You know, how do you know? How do you know I'm a real Christian? Is it because I've got a fish sticker on the back of my car? Maybe I've got a Bible on my desk. Sometimes it's even open. How do you know if you're a Christian? Is it those things? Is it that you don't use bad words or you go to church a lot? Because a lot of people don't swear. And a lot of people go to church a lot. But are they all Christians? Are we in this room all Christians? Or are we just kind of here? See, Jesus said people will know that we're his disciples by what? By his love, by our love, as we show love to one another. So we could say that a real Christian is someone who's accepted Christ as Lord and Savior, someone that, that shows love. That sounds pretty definitive, but, you know, there's a lot of people who have accepted Christ. Is that all it takes, just praying a prayer, raising your hand? during a church service. I've even seen a t-shirt that says, they'll know we are Christians by our t-shirts. Three in four Americans, 75% claim they are Christians. They just self-describe as Christians. I guess that from the 100 people that I know, the 75 that might say that, I don't know what percentage, but that there is a percentage in there that would say I am a Christian as opposed to no preference or other. Because we need to claim something. But how do you know if someone really is a Christian? How do you know if you are? In John chapter, 1 John chapter 1, verse 5, he writes this. This is the message we have heard from him and proclaimed to you that God is light. 
And in him is no darkness at all. See, John, he walked with, he talked with, he learned from Jesus himself, and he begins to explain in a way that seems really profound. But it's really a way that we can all understand, something that we can all grab a hold of. It doesn't matter whether you call yourself a Christian, whether you are a Christian, or whether you have never thought about it. We all understand how light works. We understand that when light is there, that darkness cannot be. That's how light works. If light is there, darkness is not. There may be a shadow on the other side of something, but the light pushes away the shadow. So John begins to describe God as light. That God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. And he continues with this. If we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie. And we do not practice the truth. How does light work? Can there be darkness in the presence of light? The answer is no. There can be shadows, but there is no darkness in the presence of light. And as he continues, it says, but if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. He just told us if we have fellowship with him, we'll be in the light and there will we'll, be will not walk in darkness. And he says, if we walk in light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. That light begins to come into our lives, and it begins to push away the darkness in our hearts, and we begin to shine the light in a way that we never could before. See, there are a lot of us in this room, I'm confident, that are really enthusiastic about going deeper. You saw spiritual depth in real life, in everyday life, and you thought, oh yeah, that's me. I want to go deeper. There's a lot of us here who want to go deeper. There may be some of you here who are waiting for the end, but the rest may be looking enthusiastically toward the thought of growing deep. But it's how we measure depth that begins to, to matter here a little bit. Because there are those in the room who believe and grab hold of and preach a little, that knowledge, knowing more, reading more, understanding more, getting into the Greek words and the original Hebrew language and dissecting all of that, unlocking revelation. But that's depth. That's where depth begins. And there are others who say, no, it's, it's intimacy. You know, as we're in worship and we're raising our hands and we're getting into the whole thing, it's the Holy Spirit chills that we get. That's depth. That's where we begin to really experience it and grow and get deeper with our Savior. But then there are others who say, no, it's about doing. It's about practice. It's about, it's about what we do. We need more prayer. We need a, a, another prayer team. We need another day to come together so that we can only pray. And we need to reflect more and have two-hour-long devotions with ourselves. Not that any of that is bad. But there are those who measure their depth by those things. Maybe it's fasting. We look at the things that we do in many cases, and we begin to let that be the measure of our depth of our walk with Jesus Christ. But where does John start? John says, you want to go deeper? Stop sinning. That's the first step. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with, the one, with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. And that comes on the heels of him saying, if we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in the darkness, we lie. We do not practice the truth. John says, you want to go deeper? Stop sinning. God is light. And in him there is no darkness. If we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in the darkness, we lie. And we practice darkness. John is saying, if you call yourself a Christian, start living like one. It's that simple. So you'll be changed. The transformation will begin. You'll begin to understand things in a new way. You'll begin to approach situations in a, in a new and different way. 
So if you want to be a Christian, if you want to call yourself a Christian, start acting like one, John says. But, but what does that mean? What does that mean? What does it mean to act like a Christian? In chapter 2, verse 3, John writes this, and by this, we know that we have come to know him if we keep his commandments. So we, we stop sinning and we begin going the other way. We stop doing what God said not to do. We stop going against what God says and we begin doing what he does say. Keep his commandments, he says in verse 3. Whoever says, I know him, but does not keep his commandments, here's that word again. He's a liar, and the truth is not in him. John uses words in this passage like no and like truth, words that we associate with depth or with going deeper to keep it true to what we're talking about today. We associate what we know and the truth and knowing the truth with going deeper, of being deep. And John takes those words and he turns them into behaviors. He says, whoever whoever says, I know him, this is what I do, I know him, I'm familiar with him, But but they don't keep his commandments. They're a liar. And the truth, the understanding of who God is, the wisdom to know how to respond to God. The truth is not in him, he says in verse 4. But whoever keeps his word, in him truly the love of God is perfected. By this, we know that we are in him. So this is what it means to be a real Christian. Whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. So not only does John say God is light, but as he's directing us how to grow deeper, how to get around all of the arguments of the day which are reasoning Jesus away, he says walk as he walked. In those four short verses, John says so much. He says if you want to know if somebody's a real Christian, don't just ask them what they believe. Look at how they live. Look at how you live. Decide if your life were a mirror or if you're on, what was that show, Truman, that was about the guy, it's, that's dating myself, about, it was a show about a guy that a show was about, I don't, it's hard to describe, but imagine your life was, your, was a reality show that you were watching. Would you surmise that you're a Christian if you watched a movie about my life? <laughs> Would you think that I was a Christian by the things that I do, by the mistakes that I make, by the wrongs that I right or the rights that I twist into wrong. How do we live our lives? If you want to know what a real Christian looks like, don't just ask them what they believe. Look at how they live. In fact, John says, if someone claims to be a Christian but they don't do what Christ says, They're a liar. We practice one thing and we say we believe another. The very definition of hypocrisy. But liar? Man, that's that's pretty harsh. But this is where John is at as he wants us to grab hold of all of this. And let me me read this to you. If you've got your Bible with you, you can open it to 1 John chapter 3. If you've already got it, open to what we were reading a moment ago. It's either across the page or on the very next page, but beginning in verse 7 of 1 John chapter 3, he writes this, Children, let no one deceive you. The one who does what is right is righteous just as he is righteous. The one who commits sin is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning. The Son of God was revealed for this purpose, to destroy the devil's works. And then in verse 9, he writes, Everyone who is born of God does not sin because his seed remains in him. He's not able to sin because he has been born of God. And they're wrapping that phrase up in verse 10. 
Jesus, John says, this is how God's children and the devil's children become obvious. Whoever does not do what is right is not of God, especially the one who does not love his brother or his sister. So what John is saying in that short passage, verses 7 through 10, do what's right. Do what's right. When we know what is right, when we claim to be in the light because God is light, when we claim the inheritance that we have through Jesus Christ, we should choose to do what's right. And he warns us not to believe what is not true. And that if we go on sinning, it's because we're of the devil. Again, fairly harsh. But he's trying to help the people who were reading this letter the first time around and us understand what it means to be a Christian. So he warns us and then he reminds us, righteousness means doing what's right. Seems pretty simple. Jesus came to destroy the works of the devil. He reminds us of the authority that we have. He reminds us of what has been done on our behalf. He reminds us what it means to claim the name of Christ. Because on our behalf, Jesus destroyed the works of the devil, he says. And what does he say about doing right? Well, in the very next line, in verse 11, he says this. For this is the message that you have heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. They'll know you're my disciples by your love. That's what Jesus said, and John is reminding us with this. It's what you've heard from the beginning. It's what you heard from Jesus. It's what we have known this entirety of our walk. If you want to go deeper, love one another. Show love. But sometimes it's hard. Having been a human the entirety of my life, I know that sometimes love is hard to come by. Darkness wants nothing to do with the light, right? So we love even though we're hated. When light comes into the room, darkness can do nothing but retreat. When the light that is in you, Jesus says, we are the light of the world, we are the light of the world. When we come into the room, darkness can do nothing but retreat. If we are shining the light that we have been given, If we let our light shine before others, there are going to be people, like I mentioned before, who see the fact that you call yourself Christian as a mere coincidental inconvenience in your relationship. Because the darkness that is within them has no place in the room. The darkness that they embrace, the not doing right that they want to do, the sinning that they're doing, can only flee because it's no longer welcome as long as you're at the party. So even though you're hated, though, we're called to love. We're called to love others that we disagree with, people who hate us for the fact that we stand for what we stand for if we're standing on the Word of God. We love one another, we, and the one another we're talking about here is everyone in this world, even though you are hated in return. And John reminds us by continuing in chapter 3, verse 13, do not be surprised, brother, that the world hates you. And I'm going to encourage you, don't be surprised when the world hates you. If you are standing for what is right, if you are shining the light that you've been given when you walk into the room, there are going to be people there who would rather you must not be there. Maybe you've been in those situations, I can recall being at, at business functions, where you walk in the room and people begin to kind of put their drink, their beverage back behind their back a little bit, or, you know, they're ashamed to be doing the things that they're doing because they know who you are, and they sense that light that's in your life. They have seen you stand up for who you are. They have seen you stand 
for who you are. And so that darkness that's in that room begins to retreat just because you, the light of the world, walk into that room. And he says, love one another even though you're misunderstood. You know, Jesus was so baffling to the world that he walked in. I mean, let's think about it. This is the world that was under oppression. The people he was speaking to had been held down for so long, and they were looking for a Messiah. They were looking for someone to come and rescue them from this political oppression that they were under. But Jesus came, and what did he say? He said, hey, if they strike, you turn the other cheek. Forgive them, and then forgive them again. And again, and again, and again, 70 times 7, he said. He says, love your enemies. He was so misunderstood. And so will you be. If you truly begin to walk, if, if this Christianity, if the root of Christianity takes deep hold in your life, people will not understand when you truly begin to act like you're a Christian. And you may think that they're walking all over you, and other people may say that you're being walked all over, but you know that you do it because this is what we were commanded to do, to love one another. Jesus told them if they demand one, give them another. In verse 14, John writes this, we know that we've been passed out of death and into life because we love the brothers. Whoever does not love abides in death. See, when, when we understand, when we truly grab hold of who we really are, when we understand what life really is and where our home and where our security lie, we look at things differently. Because we have this sense of who we are beyond this life, beyond the situation that we're in. So even though you're mistreated, you're to love one another. And there will people, be people who will mistreat you, who believe that you're, you're following the love that you show, the forgiveness that you so readily offer, the way that you walk in peace and in calm, that it presents a bit of a doormat for them. They will mistreat you, but we're to love even though we're mistreated. You don't have to read too far into Jesus' ministry to realize how he demonstrated that. In 1 John 3, verse 16, he writes this, By this we know love, that he laid down his life for us. That's mistreatment. That he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. You sang along, he won't relent until he has it all. This is some of the all that we're being asked for in our lives, to put others ahead of ourselves and to repeatedly pull ourselves back and to think of others as more important than us. See, the example that Jesus lived for us, the, the charge that he left with us, I mean, what was it? Go, make, baptize, teach them what? To observe all that I commanded you. So this is how we begin to see what a Christian looks like. It's those people who go into those dark places and who begin to let that light shine so that others come to know the truth of who God is, that others understand the gospel through us. It's not about some preacher, some pastor. It's about us. We're called to go, and we're called to make disciples, and we're called to, as they grab hold of the truth of the gospel, to baptize them, 
But it doesn't end there. We teach them to observe all that Jesus has commanded. And whether we shine, whether we reflect, or whether we walk in light, or whether we continue in the things that are associated with darkness, these are the metrics. Are we doing what Jesus commanded? It's not about knowledge, not about church attendance. Not about the saying on the t-shirt or the sticker on the back of our car. It's do we love one another? Do we shine that light? Does darkness flee when we walk in the room? Are we the light, the light of the world that he called us? A real Christian. God is light. In him there is no darkness. Walk as Jesus walked, even when it's hard. Do what's right. Love one another. You know, the truth of the matter is there are more people who have been brought into the church by the kindness of real Christian love than by all the theological arguments that you can make, by all the debates that you can share with people that you saw on YouTube more people will be brought into the church. And I'm talking about into the church building. I'm talking about into the church, into the son and daughtership of Jesus Christ. They'll be brought by your kindness, by the way that you show love, by the way that you approach other people. But on the other side of that, more people have been driven from the church by the hardness and the ugliness of so-called Christianity, of people who are only kind of living it when it's convenient for them. More people have been driven away by that than all of the doubts that they've ever had and ever will have. It's up to us. The church is in our hands. The growth of the church, the people that you know coming to know what you know about the truth of Jesus Christ and the truth of how God loves them is in your hands. Let's grab hold of that charge. We're in a brand new year. I'm not asking you to make a resolve. I'm imploring you to simply live as though you believe it. You stand with me today. Let's pray. Father, such a big charge to be called your son or your daughter. Yet you have said that we're the light of the world. We're the salt of the earth. We're to bring preservation and life and flavor to the world that we're in. And we're to reflect your light when we walk into the room. We don't have a light of our own. But when we walk with you, we reflect the light that pushes away darkness in even the darkest of places. So be with us as we go. Remind us of whose we are. Remind us that the call is not over because we are still drawing breath. Let us be the salt and the light you've called us to be. Ask it in Jesus' holy name. Amen. We'll have some folks up front if you'd like to pray. Um, if you are in starting point, that starts at 1210, just off the hallway. And we have a quipping point as well if you'd like to take part in that. The people who can direct you.